Okay, welcome back uh, to the Social Media Race and Community Knowledge Practices Conferences. Uh, my name is Lawrence Ware. I, I am fresh off of teaching a whole bunch of freshmen about philosophy of uh, life. Um, I'm a professor of philosophy at Oklahoma State University, also the associate director of the Center for Africana Studies. Dr. Hill, do you want to introduce yourself? I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm Dr. Carlos Hill, professor, associate professor at the University of Oklahoma in the Clara Luper Department, African African American Studies. That's quite all right, brother. Uh, if you're just joining us, you can find more information uh, in the chat. Our next presenter is Dr. Mariana Ortega. Dr. Ortega is Associate Professor of Philosophy, Women, uh, Gender and Sexuality Studies, and Latino Latina Studies at Penn State University. She is the author of a really good book that I really enjoyed, and of uh, In Between Latina Feminist Feminology, Multiplicity, and the Self. Uh, published by SUNY in 2016. Her presentation is Carnal Light and Border Crossing, a Photographic Archive of Feeling Brown. And comments will be offered uh, by Dr. Laura Perez. Uh, Dr. Perez is professor in uh, Chicano X, Latinx, Ethnic Studies, and the chair of Latinx Research Center um, at the University of California, Berkeley. She is author of multiple books, including Eros Ideologies, Writing on Art, Spirituality, and the Decolonial, published by Duke University Press in 2019. She is also co-curator of a respective, or excuse me, of, of a retrospective of the work of Amelia uh, Mesbanes, uh, which opened this year and which will travel to multiple sites through 20. 25. And so with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Or Ortega for the presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the first thing that I would like to do is to thank all the organizers of, of the conference for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I also uh, would like to thank uh, Dr. Perez uh, for agreeing to comment on this work. Uh, what I will present today is uh, a very short um, preview of um, my next book uh, that is uh, forthcoming um, with Duke University Press. Let me share my screen. The first thing I want to do is start with uh, the words of Salvadorian poet, Javier Zamora, who wrote uh, a beautiful collection of poetry um, about his experience crossing the border as a kid uh, in the collection is called Unaccompanied. And he says, I will etch visas on toilet paper and throw them from a lighthouse. Following the work of Jose Esteban Muñoz, in this presentation, I read the photographic work of Veronica Gabriela Cárdenas as a photographic archive of feeling brown. In the first section, I introduce the notions of crossing and flowing brownness through Cárdenas' photographic series, Del Rio, that documents the 2021 migrant caravan of primarily Haitians that settle in the Mexico-US border in order to wait for asylum. Flowing brownness stands for both the literal movement of bodies of color in the caravans, as well as the feeling of brownness that according to Muñoz is shared by bodies of color across different races. I read these caravans originally connected to the Stations of the Cross as contemporary crossings of bodies of color in which the cross symbolizes different aspects of migration. In section two, I discuss Munoz's notion of feeling brown with attention to two main issues, brownness as a shared sense of harm and brownness as commons. 
I read Cardenas photographs as carnal insofar as they are the sensory circuits through which feeling brown is transmitted. This reading of the photographs informed by Munoz's notion of feeling brown opens the possibility for a promising aesthetic unsettlement in which the Mexico-US border experience is inclusive of Black Latinidad. It also highlights the heterogeneous communal and coalitional aspect of feeling brown. So first part, keep this coupon. Crossing and flowing brownness. I start with a photograph by Cardenas of a close up of two hands, each holding a ticket. To cross the Haitian couple whose hands are shown in Cardenas' photograph must wait for their turn. Two generic, unremarkable tickets of the type that are distributed in county fair raffles are now worth the future. In this photograph, the couple shows the tickets to perhaps one of the most important events of their lives, requesting asylum in the US. In its portrayal of, of hands holding those tickets full of promise, the photograph almost effaces the enormity and precarity of the couple's situation. They use various means of transportation and walk along treacherous paths for days, ultimately arriving at the border with approximately 15,000 more people also in search of asylum in the US. Keep this coupon is printed in one of the tickets. As if doing so will indeed guarantee that their dreams, desires, and hopes will come true and that their sacrifices in the perilous journey north will have been worth it. This private moment between Cardenas and the couple is sealed in intimate light that falls on the words, keep this coupon. And it is during this captured slice of time that we can be reminded of the particular lives of these two people. Capen Cardenas opens their lens to the liberatory possibilities of this couple's journey. Yet, this couple is part of 15,000 others who were part of this 2021 migrant caravan. Caravans, which I read as crossings, uh, emphasizing the cross and, blow, and flowing brownness. While the cross is a problematic symbol given its association with, with certain features of religio religious structures and histories, here I take up the figure of the cross in the religious sense that migrants have assigned to the caravans as a call for justice. The cross has also become symbolic of various experiences of migration. I am now showing a photo of a large crowd of migrants. Two people in the front carry large crosses and a banner that says Via Crucis del Migrante, or the Migrant Stations of the Cross. It's a crowd from a 2022 caravan. Due to the violence, poverty, climate change, as well as the history of US military interventions and in support of oppressive governments, migrants from the Northern Triangle of Central America, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, as well as Mexico, continually risk their lives crossing the Mexico-US border in search for safety and better opportunities. In recent years, however, there has been a crossing with others in search of asylum in the US by ways of caravans, now deemed a start of a social movement. While the caravans have traditionally consisted of migrants from the Northern Triangle, recent caravans include people from Venezuela, 
in the Caribbean. Thus prompting us to think beyond traditional understandings of the US-Mexico border. The flowing of bodies of these caravans can be understood as crossings insofar as many of these migrants believe themselves to be engaging in a type of religious pilgrimage, a political religious one in which they advocate for their lives in that of other migrants living under precarious conditions. Their very bodies as the sites upon which the entanglement of religious practices, laws, policies, conditions for citizenship, political structures, economic structure guided by neoliberalism and, colonia and coloniality are inscribed, inscribed by bloody marks. There is passion here, as in suffering, but also in as in powerful, powerful feeling. Yet, I wish to highlight the figure of the cross in terms of movements in sites of migratory experience. First, there's a movement of crossing itself. While literally crossing a border may never come, its possibility along with the act of crossing with others gives migrants strength. Secondly, while migrants walk under unimaginable conditions filled with desires of futurity, there is what we may regard as an accompanying movement. All that moves against our journey, including environmental conditions, legal policies in the places that they traverse, anti-immigration and racist sentiments, vigilante violence, lack of resources, and other multiple factors. I see these two ambulatory lines crossing, intersecting in the very migrant body. Finally, there is a deadly interruption of the journey, a being crossed out that is always a possibility for these migrants, enduring treacherous conditions in their flowing towards the Mexico-US border. This understanding of crossing in terms of these various possibilities of embodied migrant movement brings forth the linkage between specific spatialities of the border, temporality, coloniality, and the migrant bodies themselves, which as sites of sorrow are also the sites of the convergence of lines of futurity and lines of abjection and violence. Section two, Feeling Brown. I'm showing a photo of the 2021 Haitian migrant caravan. In this photo, you can see a line of people crossing a, a shallow area of the Rio Grande. When considering Cardenas' series, Del Rio, I think of it as bringing to light Feeling Brown. Of course, we have to remember uh, photography itself, uh, its definition as the writing and painting would light. The photograph captures the flow of black and brown migrants coming to the Acuna del Rio International Bridge. While Munoz's notion of feeling brown highlights, and I quote, first and foremost, brown people due to their personal and familial participation in south to north migration patterns, end of quote, he appeals to a brown commons, which he defines as, and I quote, the commons of brown people, places, feelings, sounds, animals, minerals, flora, and other objects, end of quote. I wish to add river to this list. The sense in which a brown commons is brown has to do with first, with there being brown people suffering and flourishing together, um, says Munoz, despite the fact that there are always structures trying to devalue them. And second, with their sharing what Munoz calls an, and I quote, organicism 
that is not solely the organic or the natural, as much as it is a certain brownness, which is embedded in a vast and pulsating social world, end of quote. This is an organicism in which objects touch and are co-present. And there's a flow and an impulse away from subjectivity. In the Brown Commons, that according to Munoz, are always already here, people of color find themselves as sharing a sense of harm due to oppressive norms. Munoz takes feeling Brown as, and I quote, indexing a certain vulnerability to the violence of property, finance, and to capital's overarching mechanism of domination, end of quote. For Munoz, a brown commons also points to moments of endurance, resistance, refusal, and futurity of brown people. While he highlights social worlds as brown commons, here I take the Rio Grande as a brown commons given that its waters continually hold the flow of brown bodies crossing, and that these are crossings marked by a series of economic, political, and environmental forces. The river painted with light by Cardenas becomes a brown commons where there is a kind of uncanny persistence in the face of distress conditions of possibility. Oh, excuse me. I am now showing another photograph where Cardenat zooms in to the group of people crossing the river. Migrants carry various objects, including a mattress. Zooming in, Cardenas presents us with the walking width of these migrants in their embodied flow in a precarious traversing of this river that, rather than being a natural commons in a traditional sense, becomes a brown commons where bodies of color share their feeling brown in terms of the precarity of their situation in the way in which their very bodies are crossing themselves. They are the brunt of the violence of empire and coloniality. We can also see these migrants in the things they carry, water bottles, bags, coolers, buckets, mattresses, water, land, all entangled in collective embodiment in search of the otherwise. They thus also embody opportunity, civil disobedience to multiple national policies, an enactment of the right to flee. Although I would not use the term flourishing that Munoz aligns with the shared sense of harm of feeling brown, I take flowing brownness as defiant and in search of the otherwise. While considering the defiance of these migrants, a move connected to possibilities of resistance, however, it is difficult not to remember what they're against, the possibilities of bodily and psychological harm that are always lurking in their caravan experience. We need only to see the photograph of the National Guard as shown as show um, force of uh, an intimidation and guarantee that there should not be any unruliness. Um, at the site, uh, there was a huge deployment of the National uh, Guard. Such a possibility of bodily harm is captured in an utterly distressing photograph by Paul Raji. I am now showing a photograph in which a US Border Patrol agent on horseback tries to stop a Haitian migrant from entering an encampment on the banks of the Rio Grande. 
uh, near the International Bridge in Del Rio, Texas. The angle of the photograph is such that the Border Patrol agent seems to be using a whip to strike a Haitian migrant. Well, ultimately, this photograph was shown not to be depicting a border officer carrying a whip. It nonetheless is extremely distressing, especially given the history of racism in the US. Considering the body of color as the site upon which violence is always a possibility and upon which violence materializes in the context of caravans crossing the Mexico-US border that has been deemed an objection machine and a genocidal machine, underscores Munoz's key point that Feeling brown is a way of being in the world connected to a shared sense of harm and a being in sorrow. Cardenas photographic practice brings to light and transmits feeling brown as well as discloses the brown commons. This transmission happens at various levels. In this case, Experiencing the photographs allow for a different understanding of the Mexico-US experience as well as Latinidad itself. In other words, the Mexico-US border is no longer to be seen in terms of the standard paradigm as a region that is traversed only by Mexican and Central American migrants. The experience of Black Latinidad, Black Latino migration is also very much part of border experience and a bordering experience as understood by Loria Garcia Peña. To consider the Mexico-US borderlands as not confined to the experience of only brown bodies allows for a reconfiguration, rethinking of Latinidad that does not invisibilize Black Latin Americans, Latinx, and Caribbeans. It is on Muñoz's part a gesture of, as he states when borrowing from Cherry Moraga, dreaming of other planets. In addition to prompting an effective response that may lead to a promising aesthetic unsettlement that leads to a more expansive understanding of the Mexico-US border, Another way in which Cardenas photographs transmit feeling brown is by showing that Black Mexicans, Central Americans, and Caribbean people are part of a brown commons as understood by Munoz. Despite their heterogeneity and multiple histories, they, to use Munoz's terms, may touch each other's brownness without fusing. What I take as the brownness with is according to Munoz, born out of a sense of shared harm and about a lack of sense of feeling and about a lack, a sense of feeling like a problem. Another aspect of feeling brown that is important in his account is that feeling brown is also about affective excess. These three aspects of feeling brown a shared sense of harm, feeling like a problem, and an effective excess are such that they may allow for what Munoz calls intraracial empathy. As we have seen, migrant bodies become the site in which the intersection between lines of movement forward, propelled by hope, refusal, and a sense of futurity, cross with those lines of movements created by policies, structures, laws, and actions on the part of immigration agents, smugglers, vigilantes, and others that undermine and harm their attempt, and sometimes even cross out their journeys. Cardenas photographs disclose caravans as embodied flows of brownness. In addition, Cardenas photographs serve as essential circles through which the feeling of brown is transmitted, transmitted in those experiences the photograph as well as in them. The feeling of brown understood in terms of shared experience of harm, the sense of being a problem and an excess of feeling 
opens possibilities of collisions across differences, allowing bodies of color to touch each other in their brownness without fusing into one another. Thus, thus opening room for a vision of Latinidad that does not exclude Black Latinidad. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ortega, for wonderful, wonderful presentation. Yes, and I want to invite excuse my excuse the doggy. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> no worries. I deep apologies. No worries. We were able to, to hear you just perfectly. And um, I just want to invite uh, Dr. Perez uh, to uh, provide a comment, a brief comment. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Ortega, for your presentation. And thank you for the invitation to join you today. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to respond to uh, Dr. Mariana Ortega's presentation, Carnal Light and Border Crossing, a photographic archive of Feeling Brown. Um, it's an excerpt uh, of a longer chapter in Ortega's forthcoming book from Duke University Press, Carnalities, Phenomenology, the Photograph, and the Art uh, of Living in Latinidad. There, um, in her book, Manuscript, Ortega introduces a theory of carnality of some art practices and their carnal aesthetics through the study of photography by Latinos. For the author, aesthetics names a multi-perceptual process specifically linked to creative processes. My interest then, she writes, rests on the sensuous, multi-perceptual, and affective dimensions of Latinx creative practices. Ortega is particularly interested in works where the self is intimately affected, afflicted, and sometimes quietly stirred by the intertwining of the self and worlds. That's a quote. Her book manuscript is a work of philosophy and of visual cultural studies. To philosophy, it is an important contribution, one among a slowly growing body of anti-racist and decolonial thinkers in the US who are diversifying and transforming the field of philosophy beyond heteronormative patriarchal Eurocentrism. Ortega's contribution focuses on the potential transformative power of an aesthetic that is deeply rooted in bodily experience, including feelings of and about marginalized subjects. Ortega's many conceptual neologisms, including carnal light, carnalities, and carnal aesthetics, aim to capture the dimension of art making whose power lies precisely in being beyond or not yet in discourse, and art or creative practices potential effect on one's, one's whole being, especially when this effect invites transformation of the self to greater awareness of being in the world with others and of being itself as a process of potential liberatory growth. Ortega is a compassionate thinker who argues for the importance of feelings or affect, both as these negatively shape us within racism and homophobia, for example, but also as feelings which might allow us to resist and transform the oppressively dominant. In the chapter excerpt presented today from the book manuscript, Ortega focuses on the promising aesthetic unsettlement that the flowing brownness captured in the photographic work of Veronica Gabriela Cárdenas allows in capturing the relatively new phenomenon of migrating caravans of Latinx hailing from beyond Mexico and Central America and including Venezuela and Haiti. In Ortega's reading, Cárdenas's photographic archive renders the river between the US-Mexico a border between a diverse body of Latinxes, one which can challenge and diversify the colorism of the hemisphere and avoid invisibilizing of Black Latinidad, an invisibilizing that she observes is common in discussion of the US borderlands. In speaking of the bordering effects of the crossing of diverse Latin Americans into the US, Ortega draws upon Lorgia Garcia Peña's idea of the active effect of the border as living in el nie, neither here nor there. From the late queer theorist Jose Esteban Muñoz's 
posthumous book, The Sense of Brown, Ortega richly engages his ideas of the Brown Commons and of feeling brown. That is a sense of shared harm, a lack or a sense of feeling like a problem and an affective access. Ortega reads Cardenas's photographs as uh, disclosing caravans as embodied flows of brownness in which migrants' bodies become the site in which the intersection between lines of movement forward propelled by hope, refusal, and a sense of futurity cross with those lines of movement created by policies, structures, laws, and actions on the part of immigrant agents, smugglers, vigilantes, and others that undermine and harm their attempts and sometimes even cross out their journeys, even their lives. Again, quoting directly from Ortega. In viewing Cardenas's photographs of Haitians approaching, uh, approaching the US-Mexico border or crossing it, Ortega is attentive to how the images capture the desires and hopes of those fleeing various forms of precarity and oppression, noting that these images also offer hope of expanding prevailing ideas of Latinidad. The photographs make visible the diversity of border crossers, but also their common hope and the shared dangers and suffering of the caravan crossings themselves, added to those already experienced in the countries that migrants leave or flee from. I find Ortega's engagement with Cardenas's photographs, her registration of her own feelings as she contemplates the photos, and her project of helping to broaden Latinx studies compelling and necessary. I would like to share a few questions to get the Q&A going. Um, Dr. Ortega, can you tell us more about your idea of carnal light and why it matters as a way of thinking about brown and black bodies? Um, for example, should we call the photographing of all bodies carnal light? So I'm, I'm trying to reach here for how you would, how, how you have developed this idea specifically as a way of capturing the experiences of um, black and brown bodies. Um, I'd also like to ask you if you could say something more about the documentary photographic Del Rio project by Cardenas and how it challenges or undermines colonizing projects via the photograph and film, right? We have that history of imperialist um, photographing of um, the suffering of people of color, but also exotification. And so I know that this is something that you've done a great deal of thinking about, and I'd like to invite you to just share a little bit more. Um, I'd also like to ask you if you could, you have, um, you have spent a lot of time in your uh, recent publications in the manuscript that's to come, um, thinking about decolonial aestheses and decolonial aesthetics. Um, and so I, I'd like to ask whether you would speak, I mean, would, would speaking of decolonial aesthetics or aestheses um, be a meaningful way to talk about the photographs that you've shared with us today? Um, and um, finally, um, this is a kind of a more personal question that I absolutely cannot resist inserting here. Um, and it has to do with asking you as a philosopher uh, how you see this work um, as part of the trajectory of your philosophical project. I ask this because Dr. Ortega is both a philosopher and a painter, and I'm fascinated by her focus on photography. And um, and also on this uh, this new um, new direction, right? In your your philosophizing, I, I, I um, you know answer whatever you'd like. It's four questions. Other people have questions too, and so uh, you know it's it's just a it'd be a pleasure to hear you talk about any of those questions. Uh, thank you again. Before you answer, I just want to remind everyone to feel free to put your comments in the chat uh, as Dr. Ortega is getting her thought together uh, to answer those questions. So please feel free to put your questions in the chat. But Dr. Ortega, uh, back to you. Uh, yes, thank you so much, eh, eh, Laura, um, for your um, beautiful comments. Um, uh, I guess the first thing that I, I, I would like to combine 
uh, the first uh, question in the in the last um, in the third question, um, the first question in terms of the meaning um, of carnal light and how I'm using um, the idea of carnality in light of the photograph uh, in connection to the idea of aesthesis uh, or aesthetics. Um, I decided, uh, or decolonial aesthesis, there's a movement um, uh, to shift to a decolonial aesthesis, meaning rather than thinking in the traditional way um, about aesthetics uh, in form uh, from uh, the Kantian paradigm, um, that we should think in terms of uh, the idea of perception as such, the original uh, understanding um, uh, of aesthesis, perception. And so I'm thinking of the photograph um, um, as carnal and I think of all photographs as carnal, not only the ones that um, uh, where we can see bodies in them. Um, and what I mean by the photograph being carnal um, is that um, through this medium, um, we are prompted to have an effective reaction. And so this project comes from my reading of uh, Roland Barthes, uh, Camera Lucida, uh, where he talks about um, a, a photograph having, uh, there's an umbilical cord from the photograph, um, but he says from the body that is in the photograph to the person uh, experience, I say experiencing the photograph because what I'm trying to do is show the way in which the photograph really opens up perception for us effectively in the way that we can find we are moved in terms of sentiments, emotions, affects, but we're also um, uh, following Tina Camp. I, I'm thinking of hearing photographs as well. Um, and so the carnality of the photograph, it's the very ability of the photograph to affect an emotion in us or some kind of perception that is um, very intimate. Um, and so insofar as uh, we are allowing a, a medium that has been traditionally understood as representative as um, uh, pointing to what that is, right? As in Mexico, I'm actually the, um, trying to destabilize the meaning of the photograph as just a mere index. Rather, it is a carnal uh, medium, uh, which allows us to um, have different perceptions. Um, and so that would be one uh, way of combining the, those two. Um, I can move on to the next ones, but I want to see if there are any other questions first. If there are any other questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask that question if you have it. I do not see any in the chat. Jose has got his hand raised. Yes, please, go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Thank you so much, Mariana. This was an amazing talk. I learned so much. And thank you, Laura also, Laura, also for the for the questions. I have a bunch of questions. I'm going to ask only one that is connected with this very topic, uh, because I was thinking about whether or not there were other modalities uh, of expression in which that kind of opening of perception and that kind of being affected uh, could happen. Uh, and I mean, Laura already mentioned painting, right? Not only photography, which is still part of visual communication, but I was also thinking about poetry, uh, storytelling, uh, and other things, uh, whether or not you consider that there are possibilities for that kind of feeling brown being shared and that kind of opening of perception happening. And one of the things that was in my mind, uh, one of the reasons why I had this question is because uh, of I mean, of course, most of the photographs, I mean, I don't know Cardenas' uh, own work, uh, but most of the photographs that we uh, are exposed to of border crossings are not taken by the people who uh, cross the borders uh, because they are not typically in the business of taking pictures. I mean, they might, but uh, uh, so I'm interested about, uh, I'm interested in particular in 
modes of expressions like storytelling, poetry, whatever it is, or even painting, as Laura said, that can be created by uh, the people who are feeling brown, the people in the first person plural, right? They are creating this image or this story or this uh, way of sharing their experiences. So mm -hmm. I'm just curious about that. And then one more thing, if I may, uh, uh, although it's a little bit different, but I was also, I mean, I love uh, the focus on Rio Grande and the river and all of that, and this obvious, uh, important, crucial site of border crossing. But I was wondering if you were also extending the project to other sites of border crossings and other kinds of uh, photographic images and so on, even including uh, not only other uh, US borderland sites that are obvious, but I mean, there are people who claim that crossing the border doesn't stop when you are already in the US, that even within the US, there are ways in which you are still uh, right crossing the border. Thank you, Mariana. Muchas gracias. Encantado de verte de nuevo. Um, uh, thank you for the question. Um, there are There, there is a project in which uh, a, a photographer has given cameras to people before crossing. So they represent, you know, they take their own um, photos and, and that's going to be um, a, a I'm going to write a paper on that. That's going to be uh, one of my projects. Um, uh, it, I think that all artistic media um, have this affective, um, the affective possibilities. In fact, um, my notion of carnalities um, is basically um, carnalities are um, practices, artistic practices through which people um, define themselves in, 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 for example, Anzaldúa defining herself through writing. Um, and so carnalities for me come in different media and they are the ways by which people who have been marginalized are already uh, defining themselves away from a colonial eye. But I, in this book, I, I pick specifically photography precisely because of the history of photography as being um, connected to practices of othering, indexicals, essentializing, creating new types of people in order to do violence on them. And so the decolonial aspect, right, of the aesthesis here is precisely the use of the photograph as such, the medium as such, to rethink it as it has been already rethought by people who have used photography already as count to create counter narratives. And so, but what's fascinating to me is that um, a medium that is that seemed not to have any possibility, any resistant possibility, actually does have it if we pay attention, if we are attuned, right, uh, to the way that the photograph affects us um, in terms of, of these different modalities, the way that we use photographs uh, in order to um, mourn our dead, right? Jose Esteban Munoz loved performances and he concentrates on performance in order to talk about feeling brown, right? Um, I want to use a medium that has been deemed absolutely indexical. Um, there's a new movement um, that's looking at photographs in terms of you know, the effective move uh, in photographer and photography. And so I'm following that thread. Um, and so definitely painting, poetry, of course. In this project, however, um, because it, the project is, is, is informed by Barth's uh, Camera Lucida that is at, at the center, um, I wanted to tease out the carnality of, of something that's not supposed to be carnal at all. I would love to um, jump in and ask a question here. Um, and this is kind of related to some of what you just said in response to Jose. And uh, you know, I'm just thinking about 
these kind of two poles of the photograph having this umbilical cord <laughs> and then having these indexical uses that are categorizing people, taxonomizing them for purposes of oppression. And then I'm thinking about Cardenas's photos mm -hmm. and the way that, you know, you're using them to discuss the notion of feeling brown. Mm -hmm. um, and they are depicting groups of people in ways that are sometimes taken up as in this indexical taxonomizing kind of project. And, you know, pictures like that have been used to illustrate an, a threat of, you know, masses of people moving toward. It. So I'm really interested in the specifics, the texture of how these photos get at the notion of feeling brown. Mm -hmm. um, a sort of interiority of feeling as I'm thinking about it, um, as opposed to, and, and, you know, getting away from that kind of indexical sense that you were describing. Yes, um, I actually think that that's the, the most difficult aspect of, of carnalities in a sense that I find there's no normative account here. Um, I don't explain, I don't claim that any of the projects that I'm using actually um, are bound to produce um, this, the uh, effective um, response. Um, what I do is point out that they can do so and the ways in which if they do, the possibilities that are open up. And so normatively speaking, there's no way that I, my project is not, um, because I actually do not precisely because we're dealing with effective responses to particular media, media that have been traditionally taken as um, uh, for good and bad, <laughs> right? And that's part of um, Laura's, your question too, one of the questions about showing um, the, the bodies, right? It can be read as a complete threat. Uh, and so I do point out that there are different moments uh, and openings in these photographs. And so um, I don't think um, as much as we might want to give a normative account, I think the normative account would, would fail because it would be um, instituting a, particular feelings to people or demanding that people feel specific ways. No, what you can do is opening, opening, show the projects, show, tease out the possibilities in those projects and show how they can affect us. And in so doing, perhaps lead to uh, other kinds of more um, uh, unsettlements, more thematic unsettlements. Um, and so that's, I point that out throughout my book because I think that, um, I don't think we can just demand, right? Or say, look at this, go to this gallery, right? And you should feel for migrants. No, some people will be like, they deserve this. And so it is a teasing out in order to open up possibilities. And the reason I do this is precisely um, as an answer to a call by phenomenologists that are, are saying that discursivity is, 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 is not enough for us to deal with issues of social justice. And in fact, we need to find new ways of, of discussing these issues. Um, and um, Ali al Saji, for example, has some interesting comments about the ways in which the, the aesthetic right, can prompt um, certain resistances. But normatively, I don't think philosophically, I don't think we can do that work. Uh, I think it's setting up work. The beauty about art is precisely its ability to, to move us in different ways, right? And so, I think that we should take the opportunity to point out the different ways in which all these different projects are already being used by people of color to create themselves, to survive, to help themselves, to mourn their dead. This is a book about us. I am not telling 
oh, look, dominant people, right? Where there's a white crowd, right? This is what you should do with art. This is how it should know. This is a, a work that's showing how us as people of color, how I as a person of color look at these projects and the kind of force that comes out of them for us. And so from a phenomenological point of view, it's a phenomenology um, of the carnalities as, being, as they are already being used uh, by people of color. Wow, thank you so much. I really appreciate your passion for this. Um, are there any other comments or questions? We're really coming close to time. Uh, we have- Dr. Carlos Hill has his hand raised. Yes, please, go ahead, please, by all means. Thank you, Dr. Ware. Um, I love the work that you're doing um, here, um, in part because it touches upon the work that I do. Um, I really work on lynching photographs and trying to read them transgressively. I'm actually teaching that right now in my class, but teaching students to read lynching photographs transgressively, um, in particular because anti-lynching activists during the 1920s, 30s, 40s, tried to help Americans read lynching photographs transgressively. And when I say transgressively, I mean, instead of seeing a lynch seeing someone who committed a crime or an alleged crime, uh, seeing a victim, right? And anti-lynching photography tried to position Americans to see Black people as lynching victims through visuality, through trying to change, right, how they understood what they were seeing in lynching photographs. For anti-lynching activists, trying to change the visual literacy of Americans, right, was connected to liberation, right, was connected to a, an anti-lynching movement. Can you talk about how, you know, this carnal light uh, is really not just connected to understanding, but also liberation, right? These are transgressive readings connected to, um, not maybe not liberation, but to certainly uh, to liberation movements. And so can you talk, and, and I think that will help maybe us think more about how these images um, are, being are being impacted or impactful online. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. I, I have read a lot about lynching photographs and I teach uh, on the subject and I'm very moved by Lee Rayforth's um, uh, mm -hmm. work. Um, I also uh, think of uh, a previous work uh, cruel radiance, <laughs> um, the work that um, photographs um, basically of suffering. Um, and um, with Susan Sontag, I can say, right, that um, with her later work in terms of regarding the pain of others, that there are uh, multiple possibilities for the image. Um, while in her previous, in her early work on photography, she just said, you know, this photograph is awful. It's, it's just a hor horrific thing. Um, a lynching photograph just, so, just shows pain and also makes mm -hmm. a spectacle out of it. And I think that's the, the big um, issue with lynching photographs, the way this, they specularize, um, they reify um, black bodies, right? So the, the question is whether um, a, the, the lynch body can be um, re, I will use C, C mm -hmm. most people yes. do it, I'm thinking in terms of, right? It's not about uh, seeing, right? Uh, the photographs from the postcards beyond sanctuary, um, mm -hmm. the way that I show them, right? It's beyond the seeing of the photograph. But as a group, not just one photo indexing this helpless body well, that is a victim, but as a whole, as a project in, within a context is when we think about um, not being able to understand this photo beyond right, the contextual. So the ties, talk about the Brown Commons, this photograph mm. is together with all these other elements. And so it's no longer this mere paper that indexes. In a sense, 
um, if we want to think in terms of our, our Riela Soule, right, there is, there is a moment, there is, um, there's so much surrounding um, mm -hmm. this photograph. And so I, I suggest when um, students are looking at lynching photographs or studying them, to move away from this idea that the photograph is just this mirror of paper where you find the index, should we use it in a good way to counter, um, uh, you know, just, oh, it was used to counter slavery or it was used to, um, um, for abolitionism and it's what's used in both ways. I find that to be, um, yes, it's interesting, right? But there's so much more going on in that photograph, depending on the context, the relationships, the brown commons, uh, the role of the photograph as you see it, the role of photographs in your house, how your families, you know, think of the hooks. Uh, she has a wonderful piece on uh, the photographs on, on a wall of her family, right? And what it means for Black people to have those walls, right? Those were the intimate, but also powerful political statements in your own house, right? And so there are all these, I suggest that we think of them that way, um, mm. positively, negatively. This is such a beautiful, Thanks. wonderful conversation, but we are up against time, guys. Thank you so much for participating in this conversation. Thank you for everyone who commented. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Ortega, for you. your wonderful paper. Uh, we will be back in about an hour. Uh, we will be back around uh, 1.15 Central Standard Time. Where we will hear from Dr. Jose Medina on protest silencing and epistemic activism. See you then. <laughs>